Dave Miela, Unilever, the Netherlands. Um, at, the end, at the end of the last session, there were a, a couple of good questions uh, asked. And it struck me that what had been ended up with were very empirical trials. And there's a risk that this is another. So it's a kind of a Jackson Pollock of interventions, Jackson Pollock painting of interventions. Um, and you know that that set of interventions worked or maybe didn't work. But at the end of it, and there was a very good question. You don't know which were the key elements which were effective. Um, and you, it essentially doesn't leave you anywhere except with a yes, no answer for, it's, it, for one particular type of intervention with a multiple uh, set of components. You also don't know what the elasticity is. You don't know in the end of the day, um, can you define <coughs> even a diet that fit that? And that was the question about what is a Mediterranean diet, for example. So you don't know when you're in that diet zone or when you're out of that diet zone because those things aren't really well defined. So it ends up being a very empirical approach that the thing worked or the thing didn't. The second element, uh, it, well, there, there's a few other problems with it, but I guess that's one of the first questions is what do we get out of this? Do we get anything which is generalizable? Actually, the second point is, and it was sort of the elephant in the room, but it was apparent in all the data that were presented before. It's apparent in most large dietary intervention trials that we have a problem in defining differences between efficacy and effectiveness. In almost all of these trials, you see wonderful effectiveness up in, uh, sorry, wonderful efficacy up until about three to six months. You then see it tail off. And the question then, I mean, that's a really good target to be able to conclude something was, was efficacious, but it wasn't effective. And in the case of diets, you can then say, what would it take to make that thing effective? Now, in this case, you take a group of people who are at risk, who probably never were consuming that type of diet, never engaging in that kind of physical activity program. Now you ask them to do all these things. Now you can encourage them to do it by giving them things for free and so on. But then the transferability to the general population is potentially very, very low. And you haven't incorporated anything which helps to tell you why do or don't people continue with that. So actually, um, getting enthusiastic people is potentially a problem. It's having unenthusiastic people that's kind of interesting because that's most of the population. <laughs> so, you know, I, you, know it's, you can come back to the details of the study, but, you know, this tendency to do these large-scale, multi-component intervention trials, while they tell you diet, certain types of interventions can be efficacious or effective or whichever you want to say, depending on what you do. It actually, it's effective if you look at it, uh, the way that it's been suggested. Um, where do they leave you? And are you going to fall into the same trap again? I don't know if I've articulated that well, but you can, I, I, I hope others can see the issue. David, I think you have. Where do they lead us? I think that is always a good question. Um, and. Um, the, 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 you raised two, um, two very important points. Um, and I think that, is this just a sort of dog's dinner? Um, and you don't really know what works? And uh, are you sort of luring people, the enthusiastic people, to carry on by giving them toys, which is not really what happens in the real world? So is this a total waste of time? Um, so let me take, take the first question first. Uh, we're left at a, a crossroads now, whether we're not sure whether diet, lifestyle, and anything you can do yourself really works, or should you really get the vascular surgeons having a go and the pharmaceutical industry. Is that really where we have to leave things? So I think that in many people's minds, in the clinic anyway, the question is, is there anything that I can do, or is it just in my genes? Uh, which is often what they will say. And uh, it's just bad luck. My dad had this, and so did my mom, and I'm going to go the same way. Have you got a drug that'll help me? Or is there some other intervention? 
So I think, and that's, I think, in a way, the spirit behind the look ahead, and it, that, that it was diet and exercise, weight loss, it was, it was being prudent, and that was the diabetes prevention trials, too, were the mm -hmm. same, modelled on the same thing. What, what are, are we doing anything different here? Yes, we are. Um, I spent a lot of my life, as Vlad knows too well, working on fibre. So we put it in the diet. We know that it does things to things like LDL cholesterol. It may do things to blood pressure. So we're taking things that we know. We're taking things we've worked for years on soy to the same thing. We've worked for a long time on glycemic index and seen that it's done had, had things. These are, as, as, as Herzl would say, these are just risk factors. It's true. But I mean, these are risk factors that we think have a, a credible association with disease outcomes. So what we've done is we've put all the things together that we've looked at in, as individual components and we've put them together to say, can you make a really impressive package that hits this thing hard? I mean, look, if nuts and olive oil can make a 30% difference uh, to cardiovascular risk, cardiovascular mortality or stroke, um, and those are two things. What happens if we put a portfolio of things together? That's what we're saying. So yes, it is a dog's dinner, but we think it's a particularly healthy dog's dinner. Um, and we think it's a specifically healthy dog's dinner. And I, I guess my so, point so, is, 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 well, I finished my, my, my point was not to say not to do it, but no, unless no, but, you pre-plan into it the ability to look back and say exactly that question that was asked, which are the important elements or what is their contribution, yeah. contribution to variance? And secondly, that part about what are Absolutely, the Absolutely, thank you. And one of the things that we will do, it, it will be self-report, but it will be diet histories. So there will be diet histories, actual diet histories, not, not, not food frequency questionnaires, but actual diet histories taken throughout this whole process. So you're right, we will be able to document. But it's, it's self-report, so you could argue that that wasn't good enough. And I think that, 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 the, that the other part is, uh, are we using coercion to get people uh, by giving them freebies? Is that sort of unreal? Is it just a, a sort of effect, uh, effect, efficacious, not effective? Um, is it just effectiveness that we're not looking at and just efficacious studies we're looking at? That is true, and there is an element of that there, and I will agree to that. But, I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, the standards set by drug, drug uh, um, trials, which I think uh, John certainly has made me very well aware of, is that we have to get about, if we can, 90% retention. Otherwise, people start looking, uh, from the drug point of view, they start looking askance. Uh, at what the data actually mean, because you're actually even of those that you're that 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 that, that you've got, they're even a more pre-selected group. So there's also concern there. I would, I would just add to that, David. The, I mean, the point is too: in drug trials, we provide drugs to the patients; they get something. Dietary advice is hard, uh, and we're not providing them anything. Uh, so in this case, I think the provision of food or the provision of exercise equipment is to incentivize them in the same way that we provide drugs. I and mean, that's why dr patients are coming getting free drugs, potentially an experimental therapy that will show them benefit. And so we're providing the same sort of incentive, if you like. And I mean, I give out free drugs in the clinic, or I have the ability to. Why can't I give out kilograms of nuts and your plant sterile margarine and extra virgin <laughs> olive oil and put those in their hands and then hopefully equip them so that they can then, once they leave that study, go and maybe take some of the behavioral change home. And I think it's, I, I don't have a problem with it. It's just an absolute critical choice. And I, I, I think from the data that we're seeing on those other studies, my guess is people continue to show up to the clinic, but weren't actually engaging into the intervention anymore. Um, and that, again, in most dietary interventions, big effects three to six months, effects trail off after that, mm -hmm. and that is a loss of compliance. <clears throat> the Fixing the compliance issue is actually an interesting question in nutrition. And you don't have, of course, the ability to do it here, but I'll, I think I've made sufficient points, and these are global issues for this kind of study, which go beyond the details um, um, of, of who and, and exactly what measures. Um, it's really the philosophy around doing these kinds of trials. That's, well, that's the question. Yeah, and I think that's true, but I think don't, don't say that everything falls off, because <laughs> if you look at the... Uh, the Predimed study, um, there, there wasn't, their, their fall off was actually uh, 
<coughs> really not not that great. Ed, can I, um, sorry, um, David, can I make a point about the clinical trials? I think to summarize it, if we look at <clears throat> it's the tension of the power in the study to detect a difference in the event rate. As David says, we all may, many of us may not be here by the time the study reports. Or the issue is, is it the tension that we have co-interventions? As Dr. Horton pointed out, in these control groups who have diabetes, they're treated very aggressively as usual care. I think it's getting to that sweet spot where we have the patients where they will have, they will be at risk. So maybe the early diabetics or the pre-diabetics at very high risk. Um, but I would caution against, David, against the, the type 2 diabetics f 5 to 10 years or more out. These patients will be given PCSK9 now. This, they've both been approved at FDA this week. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a reality. If, you're, if you don't get to target, you're going to use it. And if you're unable to take high-dose statins in the U.S., according to AHA, you're going to get these drugs. And you're going to, if you're statin intolerant, you're going to get those drugs. So... The reason I say I emphasize the uh, cholesterol lowering is because when Steno2 tried to model what were the benefits of the Steno2 intervention, Peter Gady reported, and this is in, to us here in Toronto about three years ago, uh, that the majority of the effect was on LDL lowering, about 75%, about 20% on the blood pressure, and 5% on the glycemia. Mm -hmm. So the idea of these multidisciplinary uh, interventions, you need to tease it out. So I think that is something we can do a, a priori, prospectively, plan for that analysis. But I think that we need to, that, that's where I think the tension is in the participants, David. Uh, I, I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a very interesting trial, but I, I would have some questions about it. One is, I think in about five years, we will sequence everybody routinely in clinic. Progress is so fast that it will not be very expensive. So we will really get extensive information about, for example, genomics. Genetics so far is not a strong factor, but there are actually no studies about nutrigenetics. And we'll show one SNP in a moment later in the abstract, which has quite large effects. So many of these effects may be larger if you go to targeted interventions. So the interesting thing would be to go for food. You actually put together a portfolio of proved foods, if you like, in studies, which uh, focus on risk factors. But many of these risk factors are kind of cut out. People nowadays get over 80 years old. They are not terribly healthy, but they get terribly old. We actually do not understand why, if we're honest, we can't think it's medicine only, but I think food contributes to it, and perhaps many of the foods we eat are not that unhealthy, or at least we are quite complete, we don't have real deficits. So one of the interesting things might be to go for foods which target specific pathways, and we're learning more and more about that. One would, for instance, be lipids. Actually, if you look at olive oil, it's probably not the most um, positive uh, plant oil which you could use. So the question is, how much non-saturates do you need in there, or poly PUFAs? And the uh, uh, PUFAs would, for instance, be perhaps better in canola oil, because the composition actually is more attractive. So why not switch to canola oil? For instance, in, in Northern Europe or Germany, for which I may speak, I wouldn't get olive oil in large amounts into people. They just wouldn't take it the way they do it in Spain, because in Spain, when you buy a sandwich, they pour olive oil over it. In Germany, it's butter. You know? so, but you could do that with canola oil because it doesn't have the taste. You can make it taste like butter, and you could replace it in many foods and provide these foods. So I think the idea is great, but I would go for more targeted pathways, and I would also try to target some of the stress pathways, which are, I think, which do have beneficial effects and are quite responsive to food. I think you're absolutely right. And I, canola oil was one of the... When I, was, when I said a monounsaturated sort, I put in canola or olive but you're right. And I think that's going to have to... You've got a blend here between what people find acceptable in different cultures and, and maybe different in different centres who, who put together their own portfolio um, and what people... Uh, what is effective. So I think one's obviously trying to balance those two things. Uh, Wim. Wim Sarus, Maastricht, the Netherlands. Just coming back on the compliance, I completely agree with John. If we want to have compliance after half a year, you have to provide uh, the subjects with, with food products. And I remind uh, also David about the Omega, Alpha Omega trial, which was uh, from Dan Kromhout. He just finished <coughs> last year. <coughs> that was also in about 4,000 uh, uh, patients. With, uh, with an M M MG uh, history, 
Uh, and he, he caught, uh, caught them on, this, uh, on these spreads, alpha omega type of spreads, coming from Unilever for more than three years. And the, the uh, compliance was excellent, in fact, in the whole crew. And that is the way to do it. And if you want to focus, on, for instance, on essential fatty acids, on uh, fibers and things like that, then you have to provide them with the specific products because, let's say, 90% of the people will use that and if they are not satisfied with it or they are fed up with it, then you can provide them with another product with, with another taste and things like that. So you really have to do that. One other point, in the Alpha Omega trial, they also had a power calculation, very careful power calculation, but it turns out at the end that over the years, the uh, medical treatment and the statins and all these things become better and better and better. So you really have to look very carefully for your power calculation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you are also under power uh, <coughs> because it will take you five to ten years before you finish, and then the medical treatment with the cheap statins is becoming better and better, and we are losing the battle again. I agree. That's why we thought we'd mm -hmm. probably have to reduce what would be the actual. Uh, baseline risk of our individuals or the risk in the controls. Hi, I'm Adrian Vermeer. I'm a dietitian here in Canada. Um, just a question about the control group. You mentioned that you were going to be doing a DASH type diet. Are people going to be instructed on how to do that or are you assuming that's what they're going to be taught? Instructed. Okay, so instructed. will they be having the same type of education that the intervention group is having? They will have a modest inter in intervention, it's true, and I, we, we hadn't thought exactly as to how, 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 how much we were going to stress that, whether it would be in, in the sort of regular clinical care type of approach of having been given one set of instructions, perhaps a follow-up, and then perhaps follow-up at yearly intervals, but perhaps not uh, four times during the year with phone calls in between. Partly because I think that many of the foods in the DASH diet are much more common, uh, commonly consumed. I mean, low-fat dairy, um, whole grain cereals, these are, and fruit, vegetables, these sorts of things are more common advice rather than talking about uh, using soy products or low glycemic index foods, which may, may be somewhat more, perhaps need a little bit more discussion. Yeah. I, I agree with you on that, absolutely. Um, I think you need to be careful about what you're comparing then. If you, are you comparing the DASH diet to the portfolio diet that you've put together, or are you comparing the portfolio diet plus all this other stuff with nothing? I think you're comparing the portfolio with DASH type diet as they would be instructed in routine clinical care. So it's a sort of standard of care. Yeah. I think you know, the big question is, does lifestyle matter? And so I think everybody in this room would probably, yeah, of course it matters. Many people, most people outside of this room aren't sure. Mm -hmm. Or if you're in a medical establishment, use that light. Um, no, we have pharmacotherapy that is very effective. Lifestyle is not particularly relevant. So all of us may have our own choices, um, you know, pet nutrients, or dietary patterns to follow that we like, what we're trying to do is sort of take the ones that the FDA has, has agreed upon um, to, to lower cardiovascular disease risk. GI, we've seen to be very effective as well. Um, activity, we think is extremely important. We saw that in day one of this conference. So let's put it all together and actually see if lifestyle is relevant. I just think if you're comparing it to the DASH diet, you're going to have compliance issues with that too if you're not giving them enough education. Well, it's going to be standard of care. They will receive some education, okay. probably better than what they would receive with typical standard of care. Yes. I think you're right. I think what you're wanting, though, is you'd like to see a comparison between DASH and portfolio. Yeah, and you're right, and that would be good. But then the portfolio also, we're increasing it with monounsaturated fat sources, as we've said. They may be. Um, canola, they may have some, some ALA with it, um, so that may be part of the, of the benefit. We're also increasing exercise. So again, it's, it, it, become, it, it is in, way, in a way messy, but we're trying to put a whole program forward. And I think John's been very 
regime that he sees this as a lifestyle program uh, co with, with components that we've tested individually. I mean, that's really what we're looking at. So really you're comparing a lifestyle program, program. to the DASH diet. Well, the standard of care. To, to, standard a, care. to the standard of care. And we're not saying a standard of care, which is not a DASH diet, just, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know eat sensibly. Uh, but we're actually saying a little bit better than that. It's not, it's not brilliant. It's not a, 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 a full bore DASH diet with, with, with are, you, are you sure that you're having uh, three or four servings of dairy a day? Make sure you do absolutely come back and see us next week. No, it's not that sort of, um, of, of approach. In other words, not making sure, but what is the standard of care currently? Okay, David, I, I think that's a very interesting project, and we, we are certainly all interested in, in participating. Good. However, I think we, we have to, to have some second thought about uh, the strategy, which probably uh, needs to be a little bit better defined, because what Cyril is saying is very important. Okay, we need the, the real evidence that uh, uh, lifestyle intervention works. But I also take what <coughs> Ed was mentioning in his presentation. It works particularly if you start very <coughs> young. Because when you are later on in, the, in this, the natural history of the disease, it is going to be less and less effective. Mm -hmm. And drugs become more, more appropriate. Now, I, I would be afraid to, to, to have to, to battle against statins with lifestyle, because that's certainly an unfair <laughs> battle. Because, I mean, you have, you have very strong drug which is effective particularly that risk factor. On the other hand, you, you have died where you have all the problem of compliance. And all. But on the other hand, David is right. I mean, if we cannot, if we, we cannot start the trial with people at 40 years of age without risk factor because then we will not survive to the trial. And that's also a, a question that we have to, 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 trade to consider. But my, my, uh, my proposal would be Let's keep a little bit uh, cholesterol aside, because that's not the only uh, risk factor. And that's the only risk factor for which we have very powerful drugs. And if we give too much emphasis to LDL cholesterol, the risk is that we run the, the, with the same, the same problem that the, the look ahead uh, uh, has had to face, that the control group is going to utilize more statins than the intervention group, and that's going to make uh, everything uh, uh, even because uh, if the control group is getting more drugs, then you cannot see any, any different. And on the other end, you cannot stop people to, to taking drugs. So I, I would more give more emphasis to, to the other risk factors which uh, are associated with, uh, with metabolic syndrome, particularly with postprandial triglyceride, blood glucose levels, uh, HDL. And we know that for all these risk factors, Glycemic index can be the, the, the clue because that, 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 that we, 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 we think glycemic index works not so much throughout cholesterol levels but throughout all these other risk factors which are also important and you don't have the proper drugs to, to treat. So I, I would shift a little bit more on, on, on this aspect, Let's concentrate the, the intervention on glycemic index and try to, to consider as a risk marker all the, 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 the features of the, of the metabolic syndrome so that we are more on the, on the, on the safer side. Also considering that, I mean, all, the, all the, 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 the epidemiological evidence is supporting the possibility to reduce the cardiovascular risk by 20, 25 percent with the low glycemic index diet. I mean, the evidence is there. We should be perhaps more brave and say, okay, start from that hypothesis. We, we all believe in that glycemic index is important. We, it will include also nuts, it will include fruit and vegetables, but it will be the unifying hypothesis of the intervention. We want to compare high glycemic index diet with the low glycemic index diet in people with, uh, uh, with an increased cardiometabolic risk. And we concentrate on this and, 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 and work hard because I'm, I'm confident that that will give a good result. I think I, I, I like the points you're making, but I would also say that many of the things that slow absorption that cause a low glycemia, which may affect postprandial events, are also those things that wash cholesterol out of the terminal ileum 
and they were sometimes the reasons why we first got hold of this particular idea in the beginning because we were looking for slow release things and slow, slow, slowly absorbed materials that increased the unstirred water layer in the terminal ileum, reduced um, bile acid absorption in the terminal ileum, got them lost to the curl. In the days when most people couldn't remember, we used things like cholestyramine. Um, uh, we were nowhere close to even a, a twinkle in the eye for P P PCSK9. It's not even a twinkle in the manufacturer's eye at that point. <laughs> so, um, these, the, so what you're saying is yes, but I would like us, because it's a portfolio, we take in all these things and all these components, and they will, peri passu, have effects on, on glycemia, they will have effects on insulinemia, they will have effects on lipids, triglyceride, but also on, on bile acid metabolism and also on on cholesterol levels. So I think we put a package together. And I'm just, it was just thinking as I was thinking here and, and just, just discussing it with myself as it were, as I talked to myself while we're, while we're meant to be talking to you. Um, perhaps, perhaps one of the outcomes that may be a major outcome is that we hold cardiovascular disease, et cetera, and diabetes complications constant but we do so with many less medications. Yep. And then we look perhaps for side effects of medications and have those as also major outputs, major major um, outcomes in, in this particular thing. So it may be that we re-slant uh, what will be the, uh, the, the primary analysis. David's yeah, I, I oh, just said what I was about to say, um, asking whether or not medication use should be one of the major outcomes because we've already had a talk this morning from an economist and actually looking at the change in cost because that's one of the big things certainly for the NHS in the UK they're looking at the cost of all this medication mm -hmm. and they can't afford it so to actually have that and to actually do the economics behind that would be a major outcome that governments and policymakers should be starting to look at. Thank you. I think that's so. So you're 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 pushing my idea further ahead. Thank you. Um, I, and I, and I, I saw that both um, both Mike and Ed were, 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 were nodding when we talked about reducing uh, drug usage. I think that may be one of the one of the one of the out, uh, that may be a, one of the co-primary outcome, if, if you like, of this particular thing. Uh, and and I think. The only thing that I'm unhappy about having to say that that may be an outcome I actually am unhappy because I would like to see lives saved rather than government expenditure saved. I, 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 because I never know what they're going to spend it on if they don't spend it on health. Okay, I think this has to be the last question, Tim. Yeah, just about the headache uh, point, the budget. Do you have already ideas about how to do that if you talk about international? I know in, uh, in Europe we have to rise in 2020. The program for 2016 and 17 is more or less now defined. So you, you should think about if we want to do it in a European perspective about uh, 2018. And that you have two years time to uh, come up with a good proposal and then we can put it into the program later on. And how is it in Canada, in the, in the US? related to this type of budget, because you need a combined action, uh, Australia, things like that. We did it, we, we tried to do it also with the Diogenes trial, to have e, uh, EU and, uh, and uh, NIH in, uh, in the US, and we failed at the end of the day, because uh, in the US the, you have the obligation that uh, all minorities are also in the, in, the, in the trial, and that makes it a hell of a job to make it uh, possible at the end of the day, so we stop with that. So there is a lot of issues related to the international part of it. Wim, thank you, and we'll probably bring you back into that discussion, but that is exactly the, de the debate that we've been having amongst ourselves. John. I was just going to say, Ursula has actually submitted something uh, to help us in that regard uh, for Horizon 2020 for the, the next round. But yeah, I think that part of what we'll, we would hope to do is eventually put the protocol <coughs> in the hands of our colleague friends here that want to be part of this so that they can then use that to go to the, regular, the agencies in your respective jurisdictions and try to get some money. Yeah. Mike, did you have something you want? Well, I, I think the issue is that as we go forward, we want to limit the co-intervention. 
And so the, the, the sweet spot, I think, are the patients who are at risk for diabetes and at risk for cardiovascular disease that are not on a statin, that are not, and this is, if you look at the pyramid of society, these are, patients are all over the place. And I'm worried that if we focus too much on the diabetic patient who's well controlled, who's on every medication, and at the end of the day, as we saw in Look Ahead, but also in our trials and Freedom and these big trials, by the way, one of the only trials that's been positive in the last 10 years, showing bypass is effective, versus stenting, but we, we saw that these patients don't respond. For example, we're just about to report now, and I'll say it for the first time publicly, if your LDL falls in an advanced coronary patient, the target for LDL is not less than 1.8, it's actually less than 2.5. It's the same benefit. Because these people have advanced coronary disease, multiple lesions that are at risk, and it's vulnerability of those lesions, it's not the extent of disease. So the issue here is, we, we, th these patients may be so far gone, like the dialysis patients are a good example. They don't respond to statins anywhere nearly as well as not, uh, patients without end-stage renal disease. So we have, to, we have to find that sweet spot. And I would say where you limit co-intervention, but you still have the events. And the events can be diabetes, development of diabetes, or uh, in case of diabetics only, cardiovascular events. We need to find that spot. I think it's there. The other thing that we have is a legacy effect of statins. So in West of Scotland study, patients randomized uh, middle-aged men, primary prevention to pravastatin versus placebo, clearly 30% reduction in events at five years. When they went on to follow those patients in the long term, that benefit continued to separate, even in the people who started statins. Mm -hmm. So it's the age you start, it's like a vaccination. And we believe now two things. One is that you enjoy a greater benefit of cardiovascular health if you start statins earlier, or LDL-lowering therapies because now we know it's related to LDL after azetamide trials. We don't, it's not just statins. But on the other hand, we all, so we see that separation of the curves happening b based on LDL. And the question now is, can we, can we actually realize this as almost a vaccination effect? And, and I think that's where we need to go Everybody after. So the other as aspect is that the relative, we're doing a primary a statin study now in Canada in patients who are hypertensive and obese. East Asian, South Asians, smokers, and family history. That's it. All you have to have is one of those four. And our estimated effect size is not 25%. In those patients, the effect size might be more than 60 to 70%. So I would caution against the, there's a point in which relative risk reduction doesn't stay constant. And it may be with statins, we see that in younger folks. So we're studying so, so, that. So, now. Mike, I was just looking. Is, is there a statin in here? <laughs> well, you know, that's the question. And, and the big one, of course, in this group is that do statins induce diabetes? And that's a, a question that comes up all the time. It looks like it just hastens the diagnosis by about three months. But the idea is that we need to, to look at LDL lowering. And the, thing, the reason I'm convinced of it is from David Slide and his work on LDL lowering, that we can get the same effect as lovastatin with the diet. And these are patients who probably may should, maybe they shouldn't be getting statins, but they should be getting LDL lowering to protect them like a vaccination. Can I just make one point that in our, in our pilot study, we are doing um, ultrasound and we are making sure that the intermediate thickness is greater uh, than one millimeter. So, yeah. um, so we are making sure that there is some uh, vascular damage in the folk we're looking at. And we will be looking with uh, uh, MRI, th three-dimensional um, uh, imaging of, of carotid and also some imaging of coronary arteries um, to look for uh, lesions. And we'll be monitoring those over the first three years in this group. So, so they're, 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 it's not just, not just looking for a hard outcome, but also these particular softer outcomes, but where we think they're on the pathway. And we'll be able to tell whether there's unstable plaque or whether there's intraplaque hemorrhage and these sort of things because it shines bright with, uh, with MRI. So uh, that, that's useful too. Okay, and unfortunately, we're going to have to end this session. Um, I'd like to thank the panel. Um, and I'd like to thank the audience for its attention and some excellent questions. <laughs>